सो वेलकम क्लास वेरी गुड इवनिंग so we will uh, continue from yesterday uh, from the gene cloning part that we left uh, and yes we are on time today and everything is fine so some days are bad some days are good and it will be recorded this lecture so that's good every day is not a same day so this is the general procedure so basically students if somebody might have came came here for the expectations of advanced learning so you will be also learning advanced learning but have some patience have some enthusiasm have some patience so that uh, once we are done with the basic part then we will go the advanced part so this might be very uh, basic for all of you that is the cloning you might be reading this in various biotech and various zoology and genetics books Uh, so just what is happening is here that you are having this plasmid vector and into that plasmid vector we going to incorporate our dna fragment that has to be cloned then enzymatically insert dna into the plasmid vector then you will have a recombinant plasmid and then you will have mix these recombinant plasmid will help in the mix equalize cells with plasmids in the presence of calcium chloride then culture on nutrient agar plates containing ampicillin right then you will have your bacterial chromosome uh, which is has transformed e coli cells and the cells that do not take plasmid and they die on the ampicillin plate and afterwards you you get for the independent plasmid replication you will have the plasmids which will have that gna uh, that dna a uh, fragment and others will be not go further then cell multiplies and we have colonies of cells each containing copies of the same recombinant plasmid also if we having uh, various plasmid vectors and also various dna fragments to be cloned in that case enzymatically we insert dna fragments into plasmid vectors then we transform e coli cells and select for ampicillin resistance colonies and each clone represents one clone a group of organism with identical dna so here we can see that so all four different dna they are growing with the different clones then as we were discussing about restriction enzymes we will study about them in upcoming lectures also more so the restriction enzymes are the one which cut uh, site specific dnas is generating a double stranded breaks so till now 600 naturally occurring restriction enzyme have been identified and they recognize four to six base pair sequence patterns and these restriction cuts are most often asymmetric and generating single stranded overhangs that is your sticky ends and restriction cuts are also frequently symmetric that is they are giving blunt ends so restriction enzyme that is e coli so this uh, shows a cleavage system here so there is one unmethylated and then one other is dna right then they will produce these sticky ends like c t t a a then a a t t c 
so these restriction enzymes recognize sites which are usually palindromic palindromic means here that is we can spell them from the left or from the right they will be spelled the same way such as ana auto radar kayak then selected restriction enzymes so we are having uh, following enzymes that is bam h1 sau 3a e cori hint 3 smi anod l so various example of your enzyme restriction enzymes and their respective microorganisms and which recognition they they find out so these recognition sites might be asked in a many mcqs so you need to remember them so from where which side they are cutting a a c c this this and the end that is produced are are they producing sticky ends yeah or in this case it's a blunt end because it's cutting from left and right equal part and here is also a sticky end then some restriction fragments with complementary sticky ends are ligated easily for example in this case a we having dna1 in the b we having a dna2 yeah so a a t t c g a g c t so out of this the one which is having t t a a it will be correspondingly attached to that dna that is a a t t funds uh, this a pair attaches with this one so we are having a new fragment here and then we remove the atp out of it so that we have a recombinant dna at the end let's watch one nice video about that cloning vectors because they carry an origin of replication and are therefore able to replicate independently within a cell Most plasmids used as vectors also encode some type of selectable marker such as the gene for resistance to ampicillin. If the host cells are ampicillin sensitive, the only host cells that can grow on a medium containing ampicillin are those that have taken up the plasmid. Vectors must also have a small sequence of base pairs that can be recognized by a restriction enzyme. When this enzyme opens the circular plasmid, foreign DNA can be incorporated. When the plasmid vector and foreign DNA are both cut with the same restriction enzyme and mixed together, not all molecules will join to form recombinants. Some vector molecules will reanneal without incorporating foreign DNA. To identify cells that contain plasmids that have incorporated foreign DNA, a second marker gene is needed on the vector. This second marker contains the restriction enzyme site within its nucleotide sequence. If foreign DNA is inserted, the second marker is inactivated. This is referred to as insertional inactivation. A common second marker is the LAC Z gene, which codes for the enzyme beta galactosidase. Beta galactosidase can cleave a colorless chemical called Xgal to form a blue compound. Therefore, colonies of cells that harbor the intact vector but no new recombinant DNA can make beta galactosidase and form a blue color in the presence of Xgal. However, colonies that contain new recombinant DNA cannot make beta galactosidase and are white. so that's how you differentiate between your uh, lexodase and and with the blue colony and white colony so some polylinkers so polylinkers which facilitate insertions of restriction fragments into the plasmid vectors so like sequence of polylinkers uh, g a a t t c c which recognize e cori sakal kapnal small bam h1 xbl so respective restriction enzymes carrying the respective um, 
sequence for the polylinkers. Then we insert our E. coli restriction fragments into it. So here we having a plasmid vector and this is our genomic DNA. Right? And this is ampicillin, origin of replication and polylinker. And this is the genomic DNA we wanted to insert with the equation or uh, with the sequence of AATTCG. CTTAAG. Then we insert into that. Then DNA with the help of DNA ligase and ATP. Then you have a recombinant plasmid at the end. Then cloning the transcriptome. So we can see here two methods. One from the complementary DNA libraries which are prepared from the isolated mRNAs. So here we can see uh, in the first cycle mRNA uh, are having multi polytail of um, six adenine amino acids nucleotide base pairs sorry. And then you are also having mRNA, you are also having tRNA, you are also having ribosomal RNA. And we wanted that at the end, we only want purified mRNA from this. So what we will do, this mixture of cytoplasmic RNA that we have, we will add it with the help of oligo DT matrix. Yeah. So onto this DT matrix, your mRNA will be attached and your ribosomes and your tRNA, they will be not. And then we wash away these ribosomal RNA and tRNA, then elute column in low salt buffer and what uh, at the end what you get is purified mRNA preparation. In the right hand side we are seeing a bacteriophage lambda uh, complement, complementary cDNA library. So mRNA having 5 prime end to 3 prime end with 3 prime poly A tail. So we hybridize with oligo DT primer. Yeah. Then transcribe this RNA into complementary DNA then remove this RNA with alkali poly G tail. Then we hybridize with the DC primer like here CCC. Then we synthesize the complementary strand. Afterwards we protect this complementary DNA by methylation, double stranded complementary DNA. Then equalized linker are added with ligate complementary DNA to linkers and then cleave with the E. coli 1. And at the end you have sticky ends then ligate to lambda arms package in vitro which infect E. coli. Then individuals lambda complementary DNA are clones. So for identifying, analyzing, sequencing clone DNA. The most common approach to identify these specific clones, we, we need to make a screening of library by hybridization with radioactive labeled DNA or RNA probes. So labeled nucleotide probes are also used uh, to identify specific nucleotide sequence in a complex mixture of DNA or mRNA. So direct sequence is also often applied, single nucleotide sequencing and large scale sequencing, sequencing whole libraries of DNA or complementary DNA. So DNA sequencing, uh, let's discuss now sequencing. We have discussed so far about various types of cloning, how it is done, various methods, uh, what are the plasmid vectors and its various applications. Now let me take you to the Sanger who got the Nobel Prize winner for his identifying the sequence, uh, sequencing of nucleic acids. So basically what we do is, um, this is the sequence that is, um, is given to us and we wanted to identify uh, the sequence like let's say this is the known sequence of human being and we need to identify which sequences it is. So we will add our a sequence tag which will attach to this particular part and onto that we will add DNA polymerase and DATPs, DGTPs, DCTPs, DDTPs. 
and also TDGTP in very low concentration. So it will make G, G, so it will keep uh, going up producing until you are having this DDGTP uh, being there. So it will stop the reaction at that point here. So DNTPs will be like this and DDDNTPs will be like this. So in this your at the third carbon your hydroxyl group is absent. So D dioxy and they are deoxy ribo nucleic acid. So in this the second carbon uh, the hydroxyl is group removed but in DDTPs uh, at the third prime also your um, hydroxyl group is removed. Then comes your DNA sequencing the Sanger dioxy method. So as I have discussed so we will have our primer, our template is known, we will add our template, it will attach to it our DNA polymerase and DNTPs and DDTPs, DDCTPs in one micromolar uh, we will add. So we will have four different conditions now according to different ATP, GTP, DTP and CTP. This is for adenosine, guanine, uh, thymine, um, cytosine. So according to them they will give uh, they will stop at one point and they will make these reactions and we will get to know about that A is stopping here, A is stopping here, J is stopping there, G is stopping there, T is stopping here and then we denature and separate daughter strands by electrophoresis. So here all the bands uh, the these, these uh, particular DNA templates that has been correspondingly been produced we will see different bands for G, for C, for A, for T. So we can see A has multiple ones, C has even less, G even less and T a bit more than G. So we will make this with the computer uh, analysis, we will make these colors analysis like how much sequence are present in the in our sequence, in our um, the, the known we, we are looking for. So we will just name the sequence like A T G G T T C C C C C. So in this way we can recognize a human whole genome sequence. So let's see. Um, so what I have explained you from the video perspective.
that was quite clear now till here it might be clear so let's continue yeah so in the sequencing so that was the basics about sequencing now we will discuss a bit more about next generation sequencing yeah so technologies uh, that are present in the market from Roche, Illumina, Applied Biosystems, Helico, Heliscope, uh, Pacific Biosciences, Life Technologies, Iron Tarrant. So they all um, producing different uh, like varied amount of results in which various parameters has to be taken care like cost, read length, speed, accuracy. Uh, and you can see that the number of base pairs that has been increased from 2004 uh, to abruptly in 6, 7, 8 and by 2008 it's in 100 base pairs. So that's the thing that has been helped in this next generation sequencing. Um, earlier it was very expensive we are not able to find out about individual human beings uh, genomes but now everyone after the birth or about the parent testing DNA testing it's accessible to understand our human genome and we can identify some genetics problems what we are having or we might have in the future so this has become very cost effective since the last few years and because of that we can see a lot of research being carried out in the field of uh, next generation sequencing so there are some uh, famous names like Roche Illumina, Solexa, APG, Pollinator, Helicos Biosciences, Pacifix. So all these are the various platforms uh, using various uh, respective money is being uh, different and biological applications for different way. So next generation sequencing. Basically, there are three companies that is Roche, Illumina and Solid, uh, whose principle is based on virus sequencing, polymerase based and ligation based. So for the amplification of our uh, sequencing of our DNA primers, we are using emulsion PCR, bridge amplification and emulsion PCR. So these are three different principles that we are using in virus sequencing, polymer based and ligation based. Um, and the mega waste per run when, when you run running these machines so we are getting 100 1300 3000 mega base pairs so that's the main difference in three of them and the time that they they took so initially Roche used to take seven hours and others in days four days or five days so you can see in order to run the complete uh, human genome and the Roche is the best one for the per run so per run in seven hours you get to know about 100 mega base pairs right but whereas in the Illumina it's in four days you get to know about 1300 mega base pairs whereas in the in the in five days you get to know about 3000 mega base pairs so like 24 hours just multiply by uh, into five you know in that uh, they are working so for according to the read length how many read base pairs are read in once so it's 250 32 35 and then the cost per run in the Roche is 84 uh, 1039 89050 and 17447 solid is the most expensive uh, but per mega base pair the, it's uh, actually your solid is more cost effective but your Roche is a bit expensive, most expensive. So you have to choose what you are looking for. So I will go into directly into this uh, next generation sequencing part and explain them in detail here. Explaining them in detail.
Next Generation Sequencing, or NGS, is a powerful platform that has enabled the sequencing of thousands to millions of DNA molecules simultaneously. This powerful tool is revolutionizing fields such as personalized medicine, genetic diseases, and clinical diagnostics by offering a high throughput option with the capability to sequence multiple individuals at the same time. Sanger sequencing, first developed in the 1900s, is a gold standard for DNA sequencing and it is still used today extensively for routine sequencing applications and to validate NGS data. It utilizes a high fidelity DNA dependent polymerase to generate a complementary copy to a single stranded DNA template. In each reaction, a single primer, complementary to the template, initiates a DNA synthesis reaction from its 3' end. Deoxynucleotides, or simply nucleotides, are added one after the other in a template-dependent manner. Each reaction also contains a mixture of four dideoxynucleotides, one for each DNA base. These dideoxynucleotides resemble the DNA monomers enough to allow incorporation into the growing strand. However, they differ from natural deoxynucleotides in two ways. One, they lack a 3' hydroxyl group, which is required for further DNA extension, resulting in chain termination once incorporated in the DNA molecule. And two, each dideoxynucleotide has a unique fluorescent dye attached to it, allowing for automatic detection of the DNA sequence. As a result, many copies of different length DNA fragments are generated in each reaction, terminated at all of the nucleotide positions of the template molecule by one of the dideoxynucleotides. The reaction mixtures are loaded on the sequencing machine, either manually onto slab gels or automatically with capillaries, and are electrophoresed to separate the DNA molecules by size. The DNA sequence is read through the fluorescent emission of the dideoxynucleotide as it flows through the gel. Modern-day Sanger sequencing instruments use capillary-based automated electrophoresis, which typically analyzes 8 to 96 sequencing reactions simultaneously. Next generation sequencing systems have been introduced in the past decade that allow for massively parallel sequencing reactions. These systems are capable of analyzing millions or even billions of sequencing reactions at the same time. Although different machines have been developed with various differing technical details, they all share some common features. One, sample preparation. All next generation sequencing platforms require a library obtained either by amplification or ligation with custom adapter sequences. 2. Sequencing machines. Each library fragment is amplified on a solid surface with covalently attached DNA linkers that hybridize the library adapters. This amplification creates clusters of DNA, each originating from a single library fragment. Each cluster will act as an individual sequencing reaction. And 3. Data output. Each machine provides the raw data at the end of the sequencing run. This raw data is a collection of DNA sequences that were generated at each cluster. The differences between the different next-generation sequencing platforms lie mainly in the technical details of the sequencing reaction and can be categorized in four groups. Pyro sequencing, sequencing by synthesis, sequencing by ligation, and ion semiconductor sequencing. In pyrosequencing, the sequencing reaction is monitored through the release of a pyrophosphate during each nucleotide incorporation. The released pyrophosphate is used in a series of chemical reactions resulting in the generation of light. Light emission is detected by a camera which records the appropriate sequences of the cluster. The sequencing proceeds by incubating one base at a time, measuring the light emission, if any, degrading the unincorporated bases, and then the addition of another base. This technology is capable of generating large read lengths, much comparable to the read length of Sanger sequencing. However, high reagent cost and high error rate over strings of six or more homopolymers have reduced its applications. For more details on the technical aspect of this technology, please visit our knowledge base at the link provided in the description below. Sequencing by synthesis utilizes the step-by-step -step incorporation of reversibly fluorescent and terminated nucleotides for DNA sequencing and is used by the Illumina NGS platforms. All four nucleotides are added to the sequencing chip at the same time, and after nucleotide incorporation, the remaining DNA bases are washed away. The fluorescent signal is read at each cluster and recorded. Both the fluorescent molecule and the terminator group are then cleaved and washed away. This process is repeated until the sequencing reaction is complete. This system is able to overcome the disadvantages of the pyrosequencing system, 
by only incorporating a single nucleotide at a time. However, as the sequencing reaction proceeds, the error rate of the machine also increases. This is due to incomplete removal of the fluorescent signal, which leads to higher background noise levels. Our NGS, an introduction knowledge base, provides more technical details about this technology. Sequencing by ligation is different from the other two methods since it does not utilize a DNA polymerase to incorporate nucleotides. Instead, it relies on 16 octamer oligonucleotide probes, each with one of four fluorescent dyes attached to its 5' end that are ligated to one another. Each octamer consists of two probe-specific bases and six degenerate bases. The sequencing reaction commences by binding of the primer to the adapter sequence and then hybridization of the appropriate probe. This hybridization of the probe is guided by the two probe-specific bases and upon annealing, is ligated to the primer sequence through a DNA ligase. Unbound oligonucleotides are washed away, then the signal is detected and recorded. After that, the fluorescent signal, along with the last three bases of the octamer probe, are cleaved, and then the next cycle commences. After approximately seven cycles of ligation, the DNA strand is denatured and another sequencing primer, offset by one base from the previous primer, is used to repeat these steps. In total, five sequencing primers are used. The major disadvantage of this technology is the very short sequencing reads generated. Ion semiconductor sequencing utilizes the release of hydrogen ions during the sequencing reaction to detect the sequence of a cluster. Each cluster is located directly above a semiconductor transistor, which is capable of detecting changes in the pH of the solution. During nucleotide incorporation, a single hydrogen ion is released into the solution and it is detected by the semiconductor. The sequencing reaction itself proceeds similar to pyrosequencing, but at a fraction of the cost. Please view our knowledge base for further details on ion semiconductor sequencing and the sequencing by ligation techniques. In order to be able to showcase and compare the different technical aspects of each of the above technologies, the number of coverage that each run generates when sequencing the whole human, mouse, Arabidopsis thaliana, and E. coli genomes are calculated and presented here. The presented data is based on the most powerful machines of each technology. Further details can be found on our knowledge base. For whole genome sequencing data to be useful, a minimum of 30 times coverage is required. As it can be seen, the pyrosequencing method is only able to sequence the E. coli genome at enough coverage to result in valid data. The sequencing by synthesis method, which is the most popular method currently on the market, is able to generate hundreds of coverage per run. In fact, with this machine, it is possible to sequence 15 individuals within three and a half days. The sequencing by ligation method also generates enough coverage for all genomes to be used. However, it isn't capable of generating nearly as much output as the Illumina HiSeq machines. The Iron Proton machine is used mostly in clinical settings because it is able to provide a sufficient size output within two hours. ABM offers a wide range of next-generation sequencing services. These include whole genome sequencing, exome sequencing, RNA sequencing, disease panels, lane rentals, and much more. To be able to access our services, please visit our website at www.abmgood.com. And from there, click on the NGS Sequencing Services link. This will load our NGS service webpage, which details all of our available services. Clicking on a service of interest, will showcase the technical details, pricing, and bioinformatics solutions that are related to that particular service. Please leave your questions and comments below, and we will answer them as soon as possible. For more information, please visit our knowledge base at the link provided below. Thank you for watching. I hope this sequencing thing uh, is clear enough now. So the applications have quite varied from genome analysis to DNA methylation, polysomal RNA. Um, so I mean varied, varied, varied applications. Whole genome associations, copy number, Chia pet, chip sequencing, miRNA sequencing, RNA profiling, microarray. So now we will take to next part of our lecture today. That is how we can study these gene functions after the sequencing. Uh, first, we have discussed about cloning today. Then um, uh, the we have discussed part of sequencing. 
now it's come to discuss about gene function so studying the function of gene or protein some basic principles some nomenclature so if you are doing so let's say you have a want to go for genetic analysis screening of dna library you have a mutant organisms and we compare the mutant and wild type functions you clone these genes and express in the culture cells uh, which will be localized in the protein and we can determine the structure of it on the reverse way from this protein we can get the database search to identify protein coding sequence and get to know about the which gene need to be cloned and then gene were inactivated and we can create a mutant organism so in this way this cycle could go up and down so some terms like in vivo ex vivo in vitro in silico so in vivo means in a living organisms where the living bacteria yeast monkey christmas trees are there then ex vivo so it's an in or uh, in an organ explant example tissue biopsy and in vitro in a reagent tube a synthetic setup then in silico computer based simulations or data analysis so some advantages of working with cultured cells over intact organisms so more homogeneous than the cells in the tissues can control experimental conditions they can isolate single cells to grow into colony of genetically homogeneous clone cells ethically they are non controversial so commonly used cell cultures are derived from bacteria yeast vertebrates then plants like arabidopsis thaliana so growth of uh, your microorganisms are quite essential also in this culture so e coli and yeast they are the most essential part in order to understand the gene functions because they have rapid growth and they need simple nutrition can be grow on the semi solid agar and we can understand with the help of replicating uh, replica plating on the left side is the bacterial colonies bacterial colonies in the right side it's yeast colonies this is the replica plating so you have this sterile velvet covered stem and your colonies with the rich medium um, that is your master plate and then you put all over it and then give uh, there two mediums one with the lac arginine other plus arginine so you will not see missing colonies requires arginine requires arginine and here the rich medium with arginine mutant colony so in this way you can have different things so some growth of animal cell in culture so which required rich media like we have discussed on the second day of a workshop about various types of animal cell culture the media that we required and they grow on the semi solid surface so like the single cell mouse looked like this human cell looks like this your many clones in petri dish uh, looks like this so yeah so how this primary cell and cell line works so primary cell culture are established from animal tissues they have certain types of cells which are easier to culture than the others and most cells removed from animal contain a fraction of cells that grow and divide for limited period of time so certain transform cells may arise that are immortal and can be used to form cell line and transform cells may be derived from tumors from manipulations or may arise spontaneously so rate of spontaneous transformation varies of for different species so this is the establishment of cell culture for human cells and mouse cells both uh, graphs are different on the y axis its growth rate of culture in both and in the bottom is days uh, cell generations in the left is cell generation so in the phase 1 they will exponentially grow then in the phase 2 they will be having this linear pathway straight pathway and then in the phase 3 it starts to goes down very very deep and then cell senescence cell, cell death happens where in the mouse cells it's quite different initially there is a low a loss of growth potential then there is senescence for some time then the emergence of immortal variant started afterwards so both cell line actually works different this is your fibroblast that are cultured uh, primary one and differentiated and these are the undifferentiated cells and differentiated cells yeah this is with the dye 
then generations of transgenic mice and knockout mice so how we can generate these transgenic mice and knockout mice so if we have a loss of function that means it's a knockout mice yeah or we can do it with sirna we we just move one function of your gene if it is a gain of function we call that mice as a transgenic mouse and there is also conditional and tissue specific uh, inducible knockouts which happen in particular organ so let's talk about mutations and their types and causes before we talk about that let's go to your basics of your genetics that we study so an organism genotype is its entire set of genes and may denote whether an individual carries mutations in one or more genes so basically genotype gives the genetic makeup of individual so as a phenotype it gives its function and physical appearance depends upon the individual genotype so normal organisms may develop changes from mutations in their dna sequence thereby altering their genotype and perhaps their phenotype so organisms that develop such mutations are termed as mutants and mutations may be part of the genotype or occur as acquired mutations so haploids and diploids so haploid organisms has a single copy of each chromosome and its phenotype is consequence of that one copy and diploid has two copies of each chromosome and thus two copies of each gene right so homozygous are the one with the different identical alleles and heterozygous are one with the different alleles so we can see here in the bottom uh, alleles may be dominant or recessive so there is a, a diploid genotype that is wild type and this is the mutant in the first case if there is dominant one is there and the both are dominant then it's a mutant then in the wild type it's recessive 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 is a mutant so genotype link diseases so autosomal recessive so sickle cell anemia cystic fibrosis phenylketonuria tachycardic disease so these are all autosomal recessive diseases and the molecular and cellular defects includes your abnormal hemoglobin defective chloride channels so these have different following cellular defect reasons and they happen quite low in incidence so 1 by 625 One is to two fifty five hundred. One into ten thousand in different uh, European or Sahara African areas. So these are all autosomal recessive. This is autosomal dominant Huntington and hypercholesteremia and X-link with your X-link genes, DMD and hemophilia. So I will not go in detail about the cellular effects. I just want to say that these are non non cancerous diseases. and they they are based on your chromosome your chromosome level uh, dominant and recessive and, and sex linked chromosome so how this uh, segregation of genotype in link diseases occur so here we can see that autosomal dominant that is your huntington disease so you are having these ones are affected this female and this one is not affected or uh, this is male sorry this is female and then when they are cross so what you will see that the one generation will be affected uh, having hd here uh, huntington disease other will be not affected same in the autosomal recessive cystic fibrosis one will be carrier other is carrier the but the one which having the cftr in both will be affected rest will be the carrier and the other one will be non carrier and in this case uh, in this dms dmd disease uh, this dmd is carrier here so in the males if dmd is present then it will be affected but if it is in the females it will be not affected so it's a x linked disease some examples in drosophila so here we can see some red eye and white eye on some two wings four wings and two wings and that's all because of the mutations in their genes so that all are the various example that can do the mutations 
and results in different genotype and phenotype. So in this gene replacement or in this transgenic animals, it is possible to replace an organism's or wild type gene with an inactive genes to create a gene knockout. So it is also possible to introduce additional genes to create transgenic organisms and gene knockout and transgenic techniques can involve mutagenesis of cloned genes prior to the transfer into the organism. So some ways to create these mouse uh, mice embryonic stem cells which carrying a knockout mutation. So you are having a specific targeting gene of interest first of all or students what is the okay. So student uh, we continue with this topic next time uh, because this is mouse embryonic part uh, this is totally a new concept to how to create mice embryonic stem cells carrying your knockout uh, mutations because if I start this this will take our 15 minutes with complete video. So we continue this topic next time and soon I will start sharing some MCQs online. So we will have some classes for MCQs and those students uh, who clear these MCQs uh, will get a separate certificate. Uh, who got the highest grades in that. Those who will not give the exams will not get any that special certificate but those who give uh, and, and, they, and they get a good score above uh, maybe 80 or 90 power percent in those MCQs uh, whatever we have studied so far uh, things will be provided to them. So that's it for today. Any questions students so far? Okay, if not, then I will leave this class today here and then we meet same time, same place. So MCQ sessions will be done soon. Once we are done with the at least 50% of your topic, uh, including your, uh, including yours, um, what do you say, the basics of molecular biology, uh, cell and molecular uh, cell culture and tissue culture and uh, recombinant DNA technology then some more about your little bit about DNA and RNA and then further uh, I want to take to you the proteomics part also. So there will be total five topics so yeah, based on that you get an extra certificate actually those who clear with the good marks so so that uh, you continue keep studying about various MCQs related to that and soon they will be provided to you. Okay, thank you very much. Take care.